It's good to see everyone this morning. We have some visitors. We're glad to have you. Uh, if you've been given a visitor's card, uh, after you fill those out, uh, you can uh, deposit those in the collection tray that's outside on that one white table there. Also, for your convenience, uh, after communion near the end of service, we have a couple of uh, plastic trays just outside the door where you picked up your communion supplies. Uh, so you can deposit those uh, empty cups in that, if you would. Like I said, we're glad to have you here. I got surprised by uh, my family Friday. Tyler was on the phone, as usual, helping me through a problem with something technical, something electronic. And uh, I thought, well, I'm disturbing Carol. I'll call him back later. And he said, uh, Carol said, no, go to the back room and uh, do it there. So I went back there. Before I knew it, my grandkids were walking in the door. <laughs> I thought he was in Fritch, Texas. He was, he was here. Anyway, it was a very nice surprise. When you were growing up, I don't know if you were a perfect child or if you were just a normal child. Were you ever told, get in your room and pick up your dirty clothes? How many of you went into your room, picked up your dirty clothes, and then set them back down again and said, I did it? Maybe moved them to a different side of the room. We got one hand, one honest child here. <laughs> the parents less honest than the child. At any rate, we've done things like that. You've been told you're not getting up from that table till you've at least touched your, feet, your food. So what'd you do? You touched your food. Parents, uh, don't think I'm telling the kids something they haven't either already done or already thought about, by the way. There are so many times in life when we do the least we can do. And yet, when it comes to our service to God, we should be doing the most that we can do. But it's so hard to get away from that human nature in us of doing the least we can do. Here in Matthew chapter 5, Jesus made a very challenging statement to the people that were there on the mount of, that he, when he gave his sermon. To them, the scribes, the ones who copied the law, and they knew the law inside and out because they had written it down so many times, and the Pharisees, who were experts in the law about its application, these were the most righteous people they knew. And Jesus tells them, if you want to enter the kingdom of heaven, your righteousness has to surpass theirs. That's like being told before you can enter this race, you have to be able to outrun Usain Bolt. What a challenge. But Jesus was talking about not their perception of the scribes and the Pharisees, but God's perception of the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees. And there was a big difference, and the people had not discovered that difference yet. And as you and I know, we should be striving to exceed that even today as well. I have had brethren who said, you know, the way they applied this was the scribes and the Pharisees, they tithed. They gave 10% of everything to God. So if you want to exceed their righteousness, you've got to give 11%. I'm sorry, but you have just matched their righteousness. You have matched what was wrong with their righteousness. You have not got this, the real reason Jesus was saying all of this. There were some things about the Pharisees particularly that Jesus wanted us to do better than. And I want to go through a few, a few of those things with you this morning. One of those things was the Pharisees' attitude about worship. Their attitude about worship was, well, you tithe everything. And they, were make, they made sure they didn't miss anything. They went into the cupboard and they got their spices out and they, they got a tenth of all the spices even. They made sure that they did that. 
the, the Pharisee's idea of righteousness when it came to worship was get a list, write down everything on the list, do everything on the list, and then go home. You have done everything God wants you to do. And I think sometimes we've fallen into that trap today when it comes to worship. We look at different religious groups that are ignoring some of God's commands about worship. Or they, or they are putting things into God's worship that God never authorized. And we think, okay, if we don't do those things, if we do just what's in the Bible, then we've done the right worship. So what we do is we've got our own list. Get up in the morning, get ready, get the kids ready, be here hopefully on time, uh, sing the right way, pray the right way, uh, take communion every Sunday. Okay, we checked off everything, we do all that, we give of our means as God has pro prospered us. All right, we're done. See you next Sunday, God. You know, that's, that's falling into the same trap. When Jesus talks about the righteousness of the Pharisees, he's telling us there's a problem in their worship. In Matthew chapter 23, Jesus is going to talk about some things they are doing, and those things in themselves were not really wrong, at least not all of them were, but they were doing things and then going away with an entirely different attitude. They wanted to do what they wanted to do. They would technically do what God said to do. And then they went about doing other things they shouldn't be doing. Eight different times, Jesus will use the phrase, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. How would you like to be sitting somewhere and be called a hypocrite eight different times in front of everybody? Well, the problem was with their worship. Their worship was technically all right, but there was no heart in it. There was no spirit in it. In John chapter 4, and Jesus is by that well in Samaria, and there's a woman by the well. He begins to talk to her. He talks about some things that makes her a little bit uncomfortable, and she turns the conversation to a technical discussion about worship. You people say in Jerusalem is where we ought to worship. Our fathers worshiped in this mountain. What about that? And Jesus ends up telling her, there's a time coming when neither in this mountain nor in Jerusalem shall men worship God, but men shall worship God in spirit and in truth. For of such people God seeks to be worshiped. Our worship shouldn't be checking off some lists. When you get married, there are certain things you do for your spouse. If it becomes a work list, then there's something missing in the relationship. And in our worship to God, there's something missing if the spirit isn't there. We've I, Sometimes I think of our worship service and our attitude, the attitudes of different people about it are kind of like football and baseball. You know there's a big difference between football and baseball? Football is very regulated, isn't it? The field, counting the end zones, is 120 yards wide, or, and then there's, or long. There's a, there is a set distance across from one side of the field to the other field. And if you step out of bounds, you are out of bounds. They will even stop time or stop the clock. And then start over again. If you got the ball, you are out of bounds. You did something wrong. Baseball, not so measured. You got a 90 degree angle that stretches to infinity. How big is the park supposed to be? In one field, they say, let's, let's make it uh, 330 feet out to left field. Somebody else says, oh, we're doing 370 in our ballpark. What about the middle? Oh, 390 is okay. No, no, we're doing 415. Everybody gets to decide. It's just not that regulated. Did you know that people are really concerned about time when it comes to worship? 
he's he's getting close. <laughs> you know, the restaurants have already opened. <laughs> we worry about it, don't we? Back in the 70s, for a very brief amount of time, the the Chinese Communist government opened China to worship. And there were Christian churches in China. Did you know the biggest complaint of the worshipers in China during that time period? The services are too short. They were having two hour long worship services and people were packing the building to the extent that people couldn't get in and they were waiting outside for that service to end because then they would begin a new service and the people outside were complaining that a lot of the people inside were sitting through two services, two identical services, rather than leaving when theirs was over with. You think we'd see that today here? Not, not very likely. Why? It's that difference of attitude between football and baseball. You know, you know, in football, it's it's really time regulated, isn't it? And if if the end of the game comes and you're tied, guess what? You go into sudden death. We're going to sudden death overtime. It can end any moment. Baseball, oh, we're gonna play nine innings. Well, if you're tied, we we'll just keep playing. Maybe nine more, maybe longer. Batter comes up. Whereas in football, you've got a certain amount of time to get that play off. You got a certain amount of downs to get those ten yards. If you don't make it, you got to give the ball to somebody else. Baseball, you get the bat. You can stay there all day. Did you know that? You get four balls. You get to walk three, but three strikes, you strike out. First two foul balls you hit, they're counted as strikes. Then how many foul balls do you get? There's no limits. You got a batter up there knocking these foul balls off. 20 foul balls. And you know what the, the crowd says when he finally maybe strikes out at the end of hitting 20 fouls? Man, he really hung in there. And the coach will tell him, way to hang in there. You're tiring your pitcher out. Time. There's a big difference in our concept of time. And our time in worship tells a little bit about us. The, the Pharisees, they were all about doing the right thing, but then they were done. They were ready to move on. God's wanting worshipers who are worshiping in spirit and in truth. We say, I'm in the presence of God. I'm in the company of my brethren and a host of witnesses, of prophets gone before, and I'm in no hurry. If our righteousness is to exceed the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees, our righteousness has to begin in our attitude about worship. But it also needs to go to our attitude about other people. The, right, the Pharisees, there's a man named Simon who is a Pharisee who invited Jesus to a meal. Jesus comes to the meal. Guess what? Somebody else showed up uninvited. Now, that doesn't happen today here because we have a different culture. But in those days, if you gave a, if you gave a dinner and somebody else wanted to show up, you were obligated to welcome them as well. Well, somebody else did show up, and it was a woman. And as a woman known for her bad reputation in town, she was a sinful woman. And this woman came, and she sat by Jesus, and she began to cry. And she used her tears to wash the feet of Jesus. She used her hair to dry his feet. And Simon the Pharisee is sitting back, and in Luke chapter 7, verse 39, Simon says, This man is no prophet. If he was... He would know what kind of woman this is, and he would not let her touch him. We talked in the teen class today about the attitude of Jesus that got him in trouble with a lot of the Jews. The criticism was, this man is a friend of tax collectors and sinners. 
On one occasion after hearing this, Jesus said, who needs a doctor? The people who are well or the people who are sick? Our attitude about others has to match the attitude of Jesus if our righteousness is to exceed the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees. When we see a person, do we see a color or do we see the soul that God created and put in that person? When we see a person, do we see rich or do we see poor or do we see someone that needs to hear about Jesus? The way that we look at and treat other people has to be better than the way the Pharisees did. They looked down on the uneducated. They catered to the rich because they wanted the rich to endow some of the riches on them. And they felt superior to those that they could pin sins on. Even though they had sins even greater in God's eyes. You want to be better than the scribes and the Pharisees? Think about how you view other people. Then there's the attitude about Christ himself. In John 11, there is a discussion among the Jewish leaders about what they're going to do with Jesus. And one of them, who was the high priest at that particular time, Caiaphas, said this, You don't know anything at all nor do you take into account that it is expedient for you that one man die for the people and that the whole nation not perish. Now he said this because he said, if we don't do anything about him, all men will believe in him and the Romans will come and take away both our place and our nation. Well, what is your attitude about Jesus? Does he get in the way of your plans? Does he threaten to take your place away from you? Is he going to spoil your fun? Is he going to make demands of you or me that might mean we have to give something up? This is the Jewish leadership. This is how they saw Jesus. He's an inconvenience. He's a danger. How did the poor people see Jesus? The man born blind said he saw him as a prophet. The others saw him as someone who was trying to open the door to heaven for them. How do you see Jesus? When you and I come to worship, when you and I open our Bibles, it's a very risky thing we're doing. Because what we're doing is we're taking the chance that God's going to try to change us. He's going to try to help us to be what he wants us to be instead of what we are. So many times that's not acceptable to people. We live in a culture today that if you were to tell anyone you are wrong. You don't have that right to say that I'm wrong. Truth is in the eye of the beholder. No, it isn't. Truth is a very, very narrow path. Some things, some things are either right or they are wrong. They are true or they are false. And when we start talking about our relationship with Christ, we take a risk that we become more like him when we spend time in worship, when we spend more time in his word. The Pharisees wanted to get rid of Jesus to avoid that possibility. And that's part of the way that we and I need to struggle to be more righteous than they, to admit that we might have to change our lives. Instead of asking, what's the least I can do? You know, what, what's, what's the least I can do to pass this course? What's the least that I can do to get paid on Friday? You know, what's the least that I can do that somebody will leave me alone? Whatever it might be, 
we need to be asking a different question, and that is, what is the best that we can do? You know, when Jesus was talking to his disciples in Luke chapter 17, he made, he made a statement that bothers me. It bothers me a lot because it worries me. In verses 7 through 10, he said this. Which one of you who has a slave who is plowing or tending sheep will say to him when he has come in from the field, come immediately and sit down to eat? Won't you instead say, you need to prepare something for me to eat, properly clothe yourself and serve me while I eat and drink? And afterward, he does not thank the slave, does he? Because he did the things that were commanded. So you too, when you have done all the things which are commanded, you should say this, we are unworthy slaves. We have done only that which we ought to have done. That's pretty hefty, isn't it? You think about all the commands given to us. Jesus said, if you love me, you'll keep my commands. If you and I live those commands out and we do every one of them, we have nothing to boast about. We've only done what we were told to do. The Apostle Paul felt this way in 1 Corinthians chapter 9. He said, if I preach the gospel, I have nothing to boast about. Woe is to me if I don't preach the gospel because this is what I've been commanded to do. But Paul said, I wanted to do something on my own. He said, so I determined this, to take nothing when I preach from you, I am giving it of my own accord. Paul found a way to go beyond the command of God so that he might feel like he was contributing something positive himself and not just doing what he had to do. There's something about doing something you don't have to do that's wonderful, isn't it? Husbands and wives, have you ever thought about doing something for the other person you're married to? And you thought, I'm going to surprise them. I'm going to do this and just see what they say. And before you can do it, they say, by the way, I need you to do this. <laughs> and it's that exact thing that you were going to do volunteer-wise. They ruined it for you, didn't they? I was going to do that already. I didn't know. You hadn't done it yet. Well, I was going to. It's kind of hard to do that, isn't it? And yet we know why we want to do that. We want to go over and beyond for those that we love. The Pharisees only did as little as they could and then stopped because they did not love God with all their heart and their strength and their mind. You and I have to do better than that. We have to be better worshipers than they were. We have to be better neighbors and friends than they were. We have to be more submissive to Christ than they were. And we need to be thinking, what more can I do instead of, can I quit now? You know, for the person to whom Christ is Lord, there is no command too great. If, if Jesus were to tell you or me, I want you to go climb Mount Everest to be saved. If he tells us, I want you to swim the English Channel to be saved, we would do it. He doesn't ask for those easy things, though. He asks for something harder. I want you to get down off of your mountain and follow me. I want you to submit to me because of what I did, not because of what you hope to do. Jesus died on the cross. He paid the price for our sins. 
And for many of us, we would love for him to say, do something hard to earn that. But he doesn't. He said, I want you to believe on me. I, I want you to die to the world and be buried with me in baptism and be raised to walk the new life I walk. I want you to live your life from this moment on for me. That's the hard part. That's the part that some people were not willing to do. And Jesus said, if you want to enter the kingdom of heaven, your righteousness must exceed theirs. This morning, if you need to give your life to Christ, it's not an easy decision. It's a lifelong commitment. If you need to come back to Christ, it's not an easy thing to stand before others and say, I have sinned. That's exactly what we must do if we want to enter the kingdom of heaven. If you need to come and respond to the invitation of Jesus Christ, we invite you to come as we stand and sing. Why, Jesus.